take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Jude is tucked in before the book of Revelation, the last book that was given to us in the New Testament, written by John the Apostle. And as John writes the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, he talks about the church, chapter 6 to 19, there are chapter 5 and 4, the meeting that we have in heaven with them, where we see the Son of God receiving the title deed to the universe, taking it away from the one who usurped it, that is Satan, grabs the title deed of the universe and then brings judgment upon the earth for two reasons. One, to bring Israel to her knees and recognize Jesus as a Messiah. And secondly, then, to judge the Gentile world which has strayed away from him and denied him and treated his children as dirt. And then we have chapter 20 where he talks about the final judgment and then 21 and 22, the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. So Jude is tucked right in there in that particular section. And uh, we're seeing this morning as we go to Luke, or Jude rather, chapter 18. All the chapters in Jude are very small. <laughs> They're only one verse. Today, in our world situation and in our culture and especially in our, in our country, we're facing a real crisis. Probably more than ever before, this country is in jeopardy. And we have one candidate who is pushing, and one of the strong things of her candidate is abortion. And all, the whole world, even our whole nation, has killed many, many innocent babies. Furthermore, even the more conservative party has mellowed on its position as well. The lack of biblical character clarity and the downgrading of the church has added to this as well. When this country was founded, the people came to this country because they wanted religious freedom. I'm not saying that every religious freedom they wanted was fundamental Christianity as you and I know it, but basically the influence of the church influenced our forefathers who wrote the Constitution, the independence, the independence as well, wrote the Constitution, had biblical ideas and biblical morality. <coughs> Over the years, that has degraded because the church has also lost its influence and its strength. And the evangelical church is dumbing down holiness, buying subjectivity of our culture, and seeing things in a dull gray rather than in black and white. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we read, Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there be few that find it. The evangelical church has adopted the belief that the more we are like the world and the more like its culture, the more effective we will be. We've adopted its music, we've adopted its pragmatism, we've adopted its subjectivity. The evangelical church is more like the world than it was just in my 60 years of preaching. James 4.4 4 says this, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Those are stinging words, folks. They're stinging words. The danger to the church is to substitute a literal grammatical interpretation of the Bible for subjective, sloppy sentimentalism, mental therapy, and what it means to me rather than what it says. It says. 
Acts 17, verse 11, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so our, where are we in our personal Bible studies? Where are we in our personal Bible readings? Do Have we relegated that to when we're not busy? Have we relegated that to just Sunday morning or Wednesday night or Bible studies? Well, it seems so. In this section of Jude, verse 18 and following, he tells the believers how to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints in the midst of apostasy. We're there. We're there, folks. So we read in Jude 18 that they were saying to you, in the last times there will be mockers walking after their own ungodly lusts. For a comparison, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. As you know, 2 Peter is almost a sister epistle to the book of Jude. And Jude and, and, and Peter have many things to say commonly together. Here are the mockers. Here's what they're saying. We finished up with this last week. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking following their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things or all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. That's what they're saying. Now the church has been in existence for over or just that 2,000 years. Revelation was written in the 90s, the middle 90s, and said Jesus is coming. For 2,000 years, Jesus has not come, personally. And so the mockers are gaining steam. Where is the promise of his coming? And they're saying something added to it, they say, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. During the, cre the church age, we have had the rise of Charles Darwin and evolution. And it's based upon this very thing that all things continue as it were from the beginning of creation, right? That's what they're saying. In other words, it takes so long for coal to go and become a diamond. And so that particular DK process gives us an idea that if all things continue as it were, the world has to be over thousands, billion years old. All things are continuing as it were. That is the root and basis of our theory of evolution, which dominates the entire culture educational system of the world and of the United States. You can't go anywhere but hear this kind of terminology. This is thousands and thousands of years old. Several years ago, Faith and I were coming from Yellowstone, and we were driving through the Bighorn Mountains in northern, in northern Wyoming. On one side of the road, it said, these mountains were formed three million years ago. The other side of the road, these mountains were formed six million years ago. Does anyone know what can happen in a million years when we see the changes in just a few years? Well, they're ignorant of one thing. And that's what Peter says. He says in verse 5, For when they maintain this, that is, all things began from the beginning of creation, they're ignorant. It escapes their notion that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. How did the world begin? God said, let there be light. Light. God said, let the waters divide from the waters. It happened. God said, let the ocean teem with all of the things in the ocean from the micro 
uh, animals, cells, living creatures, to whales that weigh over uh, hundreds of pounds. In fact, a blue whale is 110 feet long, and its baby gains 100 pounds a day on mother's milk. Now, what kind of an animal is that? Plus, what are the other animals he created, like the dinosaurs and all those that roamed the world, and all the other animals, all created in a spoken word, in six literal 24-hour days? And he rested on the seventh literal 24-hour day. You know, Exodus says this. It says that God created the world in six days, and all that in them is and rested the seventh. They don't realize that. That when God created a fruit tree, it was bearing fruit. Now, I don't know, I'm not much of a biologist or any of that kind of thing, but I know when you plant an apple tree, it takes a while for it to bear apples. They were already bearing apples. And when God created man and woman, they were already Mature. He didn't create babies. He created a mature man and a mature woman. And if you would have met Adam at that particular point, you would have said, Adam, how old are you? And he would have said, five minutes. And you would have what? You'd laugh. Because you didn't know how God created it. And that is what the world is missing. Furthermore, they're missing something else. Take a look at verse 5 and following. And the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world, verse 6, at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. There's a couple other things they missed. Not only can God create something out of nothing by one word of his mouth, but they forgot something else. And that is that God destroyed this entire world and every living, air-breathing creature with exception of those that are on the ark. And the evidence is everywhere. Fossils of shellfish on top of 13,000 foot mountains in Colorado. And they're here, everywhere. Just look around and you see we have, we're sitting on a burial grounds of animals that have died and been fossilized. When I open my computer every morning, I get, uh, I get Fox News, you might as well be honest with you, I get Fox News. And one little story they had in the last couple of weeks was this. The world's biggest visitor's trap, and there was the ark. How many of you have been to the ark? Do you know you went to the biggest, world's biggest tourist trap? trap. That's what they think of it. That's what the world thinks of it. So without believing that God has a creative word and without believing that God destroyed the world and everything in it, it's all been changed. And assuming a false lie that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the world, you can imagine their timing's a little off. I'd say more than a little off. But do you know that the many churches today have adopted that philosophy as well? And they believe that they don't no longer believe in Genesis chapters 1 and, one and 2 to th and might as well deny the rest of it that God created the world in six literal 24-hour days. And as a result, they are askewed in all of their understanding of the rest of the Scripture. No wonder the church has been weakened. They're mocking. And then he says in verse 7, By the word, the present heavens <coughs> and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and instruction of ungodly men. We literally are sitting on a time bomb. Literally. We all know what you can do when you split an atom. It causes tremendous explosions. And everything we're sitting on is made of atoms. Probably feeling a little warm right now. 
But the point, of course, is that this is what they're ignorant of. And so he continues in chapter or verse 19 of Jude, and he says, these are the ones. And these are the ones is a phrase that he's been using in, chap- in verse 8, verse 10, verse 12, verse 16, and now in verse 19. Seven times he calls these false teachers, these are the one. These are, by that impersonal pronoun. R is from, the A-R-E, is from a Uh, the form of the verb to be, which means status quo. These are status quo, what they are. They haven't changed. They're still the same. They're still doing the same thing. And they cause divisions. I know people have talked to me many times when I talk to them about the church. Well, there's so many different kinds of church. I don't know which one to believe. And why is the church so divided? Well, it's so divided because we've had so many false teachers, people. It's not the truth that divides. It's the truth that unites. It's the false teachers that divide and cause the separation from the truth. That's what's causing the division. It's a participle in a present tense, which means they're continually causing divisions, even more and more and more. You know, uh, going back to 2 Samuel 15, verses 1 to 6, I won't read that for you, but just briefly tell a story. You remember how Absalom gained strength? Absalom, the son of David, who eventually revolted against his own father, he came back and he sat in the gate, and when people would come come out of the city and David had made some kind of resolution or some specific order, he would sit there and he'd say, uh, how do you feel about David's speech? And they would tell him and he'd say, you know, if I were king, if I were the one in place, here's what I'd do. Who's causing the divisions? Absalom. And it's still going on in the very same way. I know you've heard the Bible said, but let me give you my interpretation. Let let me give you my thoughts. Causes divisions. And then he says, they cause divisions. They're worldly minded. That is the one word in the Greek, psukikos, which comes from the word soul, which means soulish. They're physical. It pertains to the physical life rather than to the things that concern God. It's what I think, and I have a superior knowledge than God. Whenever you start saying, I don't like this or I don't like that, or I don't agree with this, you better be careful. God is in control of all things. And who are we to tell God? God, what he should do and can't do. Right? That's why it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. Everything. Can you give thanks for everything? Or do you know better than God? Or do I know better than God? Until I can say everything is in God's will, it is only at that time that I can say, thanks, God. I had to say thanks for this black eye. Somebody said, did you give thanks to God for it? Yeah, I did after a little bit. (laughs) Doesn't come easy, does it? Takes time. And I remember when my wife died, people come up and say, you ought to thank God for it. And I say, it's easy for you to say. It's easy for you to say. But I did have to come to that conclusion. I did have to come to the conclusion that that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And to her. Where is she? She's in heaven. You want her to come back and be in this mess? Hardly. She's in glory. And God worked it out for me. And I'm happy. 
So, so you can't lose as a Christian if you take it in the right perspective. God will always provide. He always takes care of these things. And you look back and you say, I can't believe how he did this. Trust him. Trust him. Don't be soulish. But that's what false teachers are. There are many times in a church when it's easier to be practical than godly. When it's easier to do the practical thing rather than the godly thing. Rather than the biblical thing. What is the biblical thing? How are we to handle things biblically? They're always tough. They're always harder than somehow resorting to what is godly. It's easier to do. Be practical. Have you ever heard that? Be practical. Use common sense here. Well, the Bible is common sense, even though we don't think it's common sense. But it's common sense when God's in charge. So pragmatism is a big part of this. And it creeps into church slowly, and the church is not listening to the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. It's being practical. It's a danger, a very big danger to the church. Some, something else, I might as well, I've only got one more Sunday to let it out. Uh, one more thing. How has psychology affected our churches? Rather than going to the Word of God and saying, I'm confessing my sin, I'm dealing with my sin, Lord, I go to shrink. And he substitutes for what God says. I'm not saying they, have, they don't have any use. I'm just saying be careful. Really careful. God's Word keeps us sane all the way through. We were talking about it the other day, uh, people who are in rest homes. For example, I had a rest home ministry when I came here. It was only 35 people, so there wasn't a lot for me to do other than prepare a sermon, and I could visit all 35 in a couple of weeks. And um, so I told the Henderson rest home, I said, you know, I, I, you need somebody to help you out with the chaplaincy? Yeah, sure. So Faith and I went there every Thursday day for a number of years. And, uh, and some of them hardly knew their own name. And we'd say, how do you feel today? I don't remember. I think I feel good. But you know, when we'd say, why don't we just quote the 23rd Psalm to a letter, they'd come. Or we'd sing an old hymn, they'd come. And the Booth Brothers, the Southern Gospel Group, wrote a song called, She Still Remembers Jesus' Name. Talking about their grandmother, how she still remembered Jesus' name, though she didn't remember her own children's name. God's word is that powerful. And God, even though the mind may deteriorate through age or disease or whatever, God's word stays firm. Praise his name. They're willed in mind, and they're devoid of the spirit. Jude's description of these men is that they're not acting according to the spirit because there's no indwelling spirit within them. They're void of it. Romans 8, 9 says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Being a Christian means you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And if you have to wait for the Holy Spirit, or you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you are unsaved. And that's characteristic of false teachers. They are not saved. Since they are not having the Spirit, they have no understanding whatsoever of God's will or purpose. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. We forget this sometimes. We forget the fact that the average person on the street, the unbeliever, has no concept of God. He may have a figure of morality, he knows some things are wrong and right, 
And he may even recognize there is a God, and he may even recognize he had a son, Jesus. But he's not born again, so he doesn't have the Spirit. Here's what Paul said, but just as it's written, things which eye has not seen, nor ear has not heard, and have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. That's not about the future, that's now. You have no idea what God has prepared for you as you look ahead by faith. We put, it, we put that verse in our uh, wedding rings uh, for us to remember. We had no idea when we got married what God had in store for us, but we were looking forward to what he had in store for us. And he says, for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all the things, even the depths of God. If you're a believer in Christ, you can know more than people that have the same IQ of Albert Einstein. You know more than the world. You've been let in, in part, what God's own heart is and what he has done. He says, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? In other words, men understand men. When I see things happen, I understand. I, being a man, I say, yeah, I understand. I can understand why he fell in sin. I, I myself, being a sinner, I understand that. Or I see a man's particular action in, in a marriage, I can say, I understand it because I'm a man. I know that. Same way the women as well. We understand, women understand women, men understand men just because we're the same. But the Spirit of God knows all the things of God and he reveals it to us. You could study the Bible 24-7 all your life and never come to a full comprehension of who and what God is. He says, now we've, he says, even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we've received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is in the form of God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. How much more are we ought to appreciate his creation? How much more ought we love one another? How much more ought we ought to serve him when we really know who God is with the Holy Spirit inside? Verse 13, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those things taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. In other words, you take the Word of God, we saw it in Sunday school, you take this portion of the Word of God, you go compare it with that other portion of the Word of God, and you get the full meaning of what's going on. Every believer here can know the Word of God, and every believer here can form a theology, a biblical theology, a biblical foundation on who and what the word is. And that's what he's telling us in verse 20. When he looks at the edification of the believer, he tells us about the growth in faith. First of all, he starts with a Christian discipline. But you, beloved, be building yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Jude turns to addressing the believer now. But you, beloved, from these to you. Now you. How are you going to live in a time of apostasy? How are you going to live when all this garbage is coming down the pike, even in the church, collectively? So he turns to addressing the believer who's living in the midst of all this. But you, beloved, we talked about that in verse 17. Who did God call beloved? His son. At his baptism, he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. At the transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. In his priestly prayer in John 17, he said, if you know Christ, you are one with us. Where is beloved? Can you imagine that? As ugly as we are, that God loves us and calls us beloved? Shocks me. But I'm sure glad of it. He says, be building yourself up. The participle building yourself up is present tense, which means continually building yourself up. 
Now we're going through a building project. First thing they're going to do is remove these trees, then they're going to move some dirt, and they're going to do this, and they're going to lay a foundation, and they're going to build on a foundation, then they're going to finish the inside. Building is a process, right? Except creation, when God created the world, otherwise it's building. And you and I are in the process of strengthening our own faith in these days. If you're not in the Word, you need to get in it, my friend. In my daily Bible reading, uh, uh, I'm going through this book, read the Bible in a year, and I read one, two chapters in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, and read the Psalm twice and go through the book of Proverbs. And this morning happened to be, I was reading Isaiah chapter 40, and then I went to Ephesians chapter 1. You want to talk about a powerful portion of Scripture. Read Isaiah 40 and then follow it with Ephesians chapter 1. Man, that's heavy. Be building yourself up is a continuous process to be done in your holy, in your holy life, in your personal lives, in your holy faith. Matthew 16, just look at these verses. We got them on the board, part of them, and just look at the word build. Matthew 16, 18, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Acts 20, verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to what? Build you up and give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore, encourage one another and what? Build up one another, just as also you are doing. Luke chapter 6, 48 and 49, he's like a man, what? Building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on a rock. And then when the flood uh, occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it. Why? Because it had been well built. I watched a little video yesterday afternoon on YouTube and uh, they showed a flood and there were million dollar mansions and the water was rushing and you could see the dirt falling into the water underneath the foundation of the houses. So I waited through all of that just to see a house fall and it did. How many houses have fall, fallen because they've been built on what? Anybody been to Sunday school? Sang that song? Build your house upon the rock? It was built upon the sand. Had no foundation. You wonder why some people come and flourish in the faith and suddenly are gone? They weren't built on a rock. They'll build on a human rationalization. It wasn't built on a rock. It was never there. Now we find it when the storm comes. We talked about it this morning earlier. When you believe in God and when you trust God at some point, the minute you trust God on a point, you're going to wham, you're going to get a test. Uh, God is not like we run schools. You go for a while and then once you're tested on the material. As soon as you believe the material in God's kingdom, then you're tested on that material. Right, right. You just test it. Quick. His tests, his tests are thorough, by the way. We used to have a professor uh, uh, by the name of Homer Kent Jr. And when he would give a test, we'd say, what, what, what's in this test? And he'd say, everything. There were no high points. You, he had to know the material. Look at Romans 14, 19. So we pursue things which make for peace and the what? Building up. 1 Corinthians 3, 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master who? Builder. And laid a foundation and another is what? Building. Each man must be careful how he what? Builds. And here's the summary of it. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever and eternity, and in the day of eternity. Amen. 
What are we to be going? Growing. You ought to be a better Christian this year than last year, today than yesterday. Growing. Shaking off old junk habits. Shaking off that which is nonsense and adapting to that which is of God through the Holy Spirit. He says, build on your most holy faith. Now, some have thought maybe this is a personal faith, like it takes faith to go ahead and build in a time when uh, interest rates are high, but by the way, when we signed the contract, they came down one notch. Isn't that interesting? Not enough. We'd like more notches than that, but... The reference is to, not to our personal faith here necessarily, but to the faith which is the foundation of our doctrinal beliefs. How solid are your beliefs? How vast are your beliefs? How vast are my beliefs? How solid is my belief? How do you handle a test? I'll tell you what James says. When you fall into a temptation or a trial, you're to count it all. What? Joy. How long does it take you to count it all joy? It takes a while, doesn't it? The more mature you are, the sooner you can say, thank you, Lord, and count it joy. It's a test of your maturity. That doctrinal faith is very important. Very important. It's the foundation. It is the rock that holds your house up when the winds come. And they're coming, by the way. This is the first day of fall. They're coming. We're going to have snow, and we're going to have wind, and we're going to have all that, so make your preparations. And then he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying is another one of those continuous participles. Continually pray. 1 Thessalonians 5. Pray without ceasing. Continue to pray. May, you're going to go through these times. Make it a matter of prayer. First thing, pray. God, I don't know what to do. Give me wisdom. And what did he tell us? James 5.1. Anyone ask wisdom? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Don't panic. Don't run off in 40 different directions. Stop and just think it through. I read an interesting story, maybe some of you read it too, about uh, a, a, tour sh a tour ship. What do you call them? I don't think we call them tour ships. Or what do you call these ships where you go? Pardon? Cruise ship. It was in the Ab Arabian Sea. And a, a military man had been in the military for a long time, and his wife, and when he got out, he said, we're just going to sit on a cruise and enjoy it. While he's sitting on a cruise, he was looking out over the vastless ocean, and all at once he saw three ships. His first impression was they're fishing trips, but as he looked at them, he said, no, I, they're not fishing trips. They look more like pirate ships. So his instincts went to the captain of the ship, and he said, fella, we got pirate ships approaching, and they're approaching to stop the ship, board the ship, and rob everybody of their cash and all their jewels. So they took action, and they caught two of them as they boarded the ship. But eventually all of them boarded the ship, and the captain of the ship, and this man quickly thinking, went to the captain, and he said, give me your suit. I'll dress up as the captain, and I'll go meet him. They're all armed, heavily armed with long rifles. And he meets them, and he says, what do you guys want? Pretending to be the captain. And they said, you know, uh, we want the riches. He said, I'll t uh, to save the ship and save lives and everything, I'll just take you to the, where we keep all the treasures. And then, then you can go. And he didn't know. He was... Inside, he's full of trepidation, but he went, and they kept, he went into the hollow of the ship, and as they went down there, the people, the guys that were following him are getting edgier and edgier and edgier as went. He opened the door, and here it was full of jewelry, and it was full of everything that they sell, you know, in the jewelry store, et cetera, and they all started filling their pockets, 
And at that particular time, all the crew descended on him. What a guy of thinking, thinking of his, his thing. And you know, I have no idea why I told that story. <laughs> it's time for Rick to come. Uh, if you can get an application out of there, <laughs> tell me. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Let's get back there. I'll tell you why I told the story. I liked it. I just liked the story. Some guy using his head. Praying, continually praying. So when you get in these panic, you're, if you're on a cruise ship, and you see three ships coming, and you see they have, they're armed, here's what you do. Pray. Okay? God's Word is His communication to us, and praying is our response to Him. And prayer can take on many forms, such as worship, committal, confession, praying for one another, and praying for your own needs. Now it says praying in the Holy Spirit. That's a catch -a -roo there. Uh, it doesn't mean you go in and pray in some kind of unknown, groaning, gibberish language. Take a look at Romans 8, verse 26. I've got it on the board for you. Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. You don't know how to pray as you should. And, and we have a problem. One guy wants rain on his crops, and the other one just as mowed his hay, and he doesn't want rain. Right? So one guy's praying, please bring rain. The other guy's praying, don't let it rain. We don't know how to pray. However, we have an aid. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. And how does he do it? With groanings too deep for words. In other words, it's not you doing the groaning. It's the Spirit who does it. In words we can't understand. In language we don't know. He does the groaning. Not people. I've heard people say, well, I didn't know how to pray, so I just kind of groaned. No, you just pray the way you pray, and God the Holy Spirit will take your prayer and interpret that prayer according to God's will. You don't have to get in, go around, dance around a room. You don't have to go through some kind of anguish. You just bring your prayer to God and let God take care of the prayer, the Holy, God the Holy Spirit in this case. Why? In verse 27, he searches the heart. And knows the mind of the Spirit. God knows the mind of the Spirit. Because he intercedes for the saints according to what? The will of God. I've told you that story many times about back to the Bible when it was run by Theodore F. And when he got started, he kept praying, you know, while he's going through seminary during the dirty 30s. And he had no job and he was going... And every morning, he and his wife would pray at breakfast, God, give me a job. All the time during seminary, he kept praying, Lord, we need a job. He's about ready to graduate and looks at his wife and he says, we're about ready to graduate. We don't need a job. All the time, God was answering his prayer and bringing in finances from friends and relatives. What he thought he needed, God was providing in a way totally different. God's saying to God, Spirit saying to God, you know what Theodore Epp needs? He needs finances. He needs time to do his studies. And a job would rob him of that. So just give him the finance, please. See, sometimes you pray for things and you don't think they're being answered. And God says, I'll answer it according to my will, which is better than your will anyway. Prayer, which is prompted, led, and under the control of the Holy Spirit. You know the best thing to do is confess your sin and then pray. John, 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He continues with the believer in verse 21 and he says, keep yourself in the love of God. 
Jude is continuing to address his address to believers and their responsibility to God. Now here, keep is a, a command. Keep yourself, a military command. Keep yourself in the love of God. You know what John says? If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Be obedient. If you really love God, be obedient. That's a proof you love it. Look at Jude, uh, verse 24. He says to us in this case, he, uh, God keeps us eternally, but we have the responsibility to be obedient. Look at verse 24. It's used as a benediction in many churches. Now unto him who is able to keep you from what? I didn't hear you. Stumbling. And to make you what? Stand. In the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy. God keeps us. Our responsibility is to keep in the love of God. We're eternally secure. We're saved forever. But if you're truly a believer, you have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility to walk with him in the spirit. And he says then, keep that. The believer has that responsibility to walk in the spirit and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what it means to keep yourself in the love of God. Look at Philippians. I got it on the board. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not work for your salvation, but let that salvation that God has saved you, let it work through you. Give it an opportunity to build you up, to encourage you, to strengthen you. To be the light, not under a bushel, but a light out in the open. Waiting anxiously for the mercy, my beloved, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Waiting anxiously is a compound word. It is also one of those that is, again, a, a participle, waiting constantly. It's a compound word with a, pro, with a preposition for or before ahead of the word, which means to welcome. There's a, there's a, this welcome word is an interesting word in the original. It's a word that means you feel at home. Uh, if, you were to, if you felt at home at our house, and I always, always hope you do, that's our prayer that anyway, that if you come into our house and you feel welcome and you're and you feel thirsty, you can go to the refrigerator and see what we have to drink. A and you don't feel embarrassed at all. That's feeling at home, right? You can just go in and we say, make yourself at home. Okay, I will. I'll go see if you got some pop in the refrigerator. It's feeling at home. And so he's saying, and when you put a prefix before it, it really intensifies that, to feel at home. And the believer is looking forward to being welcomed into the personal presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. As was stressed in one of our hymns this morning, one glimpse of here de his dear face, what? All, you don't know, I forgot that song. Let's go over it again. One glimpse of, how's it go, Randy? <laughs> One glimpse of his face. And you wanted us to smile at it, Randy. <laughs> One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. When you get there, what does it matter that your lawn's drying up? What does it matter? Uh, we have a, a saying on our wall that our mother, my mother-in-law, Faith's mother, always used, in the light of eternity, what does this matter? How many times do we get bent out of shape of stuff that's really worth nothing? 
What does it really matter? The believer enjoys the consciousness of God's love is naturally looking for the personal return of Jesus, isn't he? The believer receives mercy when he believed in Christ, having received forgiveness and all the things that go with it. But one of the greatest mercies is that we're going to be in heaven forever. Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. Let's close on that if you take and turn to that passage. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and through 14. Titus 2, 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Here it is. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself his own possession, zealous for good deeds. If you're here this morning and you're just playing church and you're just here because that's what you do on Sunday morning, if you're here this morning and you've never truly come to grips with God and laid your life open to him and said, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need salvation. I repent of my sin and I believe that you died for me and wiped out all my sin. And I want that. I want to be your child. This is the morning to do it. You didn't come here by accident. I believe that every pew that is filled with a person is here because it's God's will. And I believe God will do a work in your life as well. Don't be stubborn. Don't be like the world. Open yourself up to him. And place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ if you've not done so. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand. We're not going to ask you to come forward. You can make this transaction. You can become a Christian right where you sit in the privacy of your own mind. Make it. Father, we pray that you will cause the Spirit of God to move within the heart of every person here, and especially those who do not know you as Savior. May they be convicted by the Holy Spirit in righteousness and judgment and sin. And we commit them to you and we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's